In our modern world, stimulation is at an all-time high. According to analytical company IBM, 90% of the data created since the dawn of time has been generated in the last two years alone. With distractions at every turn, our brains process more information now than ever before. But is all the stimulation too much? Would we benefit from just getting away from it all? What if I told you there was a device called an isolation tank that can remove you from nearly all sensory stimulation? You think you'd ever try something like that? It's yeah, I can't imagine that I would. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Sensory deprivation? Well, I remember they made a movie about it. You're gonna be delusional and, and you're gonna be uh, hallucinating and that's what's gonna happen. And the guy turned into like a, some kind of mute. But we torture, you know. People that are kept like in dark rooms might lose their vision. It currently seems to be associated with the strange, fringe, and even bizarre. But in spite of public perception, a growing community of people claim just the opposite, that reducing sensory input might just be what we all need. It's good, man. I feel my body tingling right now. Just <laughs> It's amazing. It's just, it's been amazing. Amazing. It's amazing. That was just so wonderful. Sometimes I just feel like I need to have the float. I can't, I can't believe that not more people don't know about this. But these people aren't alone in their opinion. Research started in the 1950s has produced dozens of scientific studies touting the benefits of flotation. So why the disconnect between public opinion and research? Can laying in a dark box really be that useful? And if so, why is such a simple, enjoyable activity used recreationally for decades still so unknown and underutilized? What happened to stifle its growth and popularity, and why hasn't it been explored more extensively? After my friend and I tried floating for ourselves and discovered this discrepancy, we wanted to answer these questions, so we traveled across the country to visit float center owners, researchers, doctors, float newcomers, and more. Here's what we discovered. shower before and after your float. Um, we have to flip off all the lights before climbing into this. Um, it's 10 inches deep and there's a thousand pounds of Epsom salts in here. Um, there's vents in the back so you're always getting air circulating in. And we have um, speakers built in so that when your time's up we'll just turn the music on and that'll be your cue. The isolation tank serves to restrict the mind and body's access to all perceptible external sensory input. The ideal tank environment is lightless and near soundproof and is filled with 8 to 10 inches of water, which is heated to around 93.5 degrees to match the average temperature of the skin's surface. The water is saturated with 800 to 1200 pounds of pharmaceutical grade Epsom salt and the buoyancy of the resulting solution works to offset the effects of gravity allowing one to float effortlessly atop the water. Once stimulation from the outside world is reduced to an absolute minimum and the input from gravity, light, sound, and touch fade away, the body is allowed to decompress, releasing many of its usual tensions, and the mind is freed from its normal external transactions. Many people report feeling weightless, relaxed, and introspective. You get in the tank and you can't feel the difference between water and air and all of a sudden you're freed. When you're in an environment that's in blackness and eventually you lose 
context for what the orientation of your body is in space because you know the interface between the water and the, and the warm air dissipates and, and disappears. You know, it's funny, I'll, I'll tell friends about it and they'll, they'll say, yeah, I'll give it a shot, but you know, what do I do in there? So what, you don't do anything. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't just be alone with my thoughts. <laughs> really? Whose thoughts are you with? <laughs> I just don't get that. A lot of people I've talked to, when they said, well, do you get in there naked or do you get in there with a baby suit on? I said, get in there naked. And they said, ee, you know? And I said, you're in the room by yourself, the door's locked. You get in there and you float. If you're really self-conscious, close the lid. You go in that room and you shut the door. It's just you and yourself and your mind. talking about it, I was kind of interested, but you know, I didn't know, I was kind of up in the air, would have never heard of it before, but uh, slightly but surely they talked me into it, and um, you know, you gotta try everything at least once, you know, so I figured I'd give it a try. Actually, it was better than I expected, because you know, I'm thinking I'm gonna get in the tank and, you know, get all claustrophobic, I'm hearing other people talk about it, how it's dark and all this stuff, but it was actually very relaxing. Um, I have a lot of personal injuries myself that I don't even feel right now because of all the relaxation. I don't, it's, I'm not even thinking about that type of stuff right now, <laughs> just to be honest with you, it's just like cleared my whole mind. I, I just floated for the first time last night. My experience was uh, not as amazing as some. I understand that there are some people who have like a total spiritual experience and awakening or whatever. And for me, it wasn't exactly that, but the, the loss of your body, like you could literally feel it dissolve away or disappear or something like that. And it just kind of left you sort of sitting there in the middle of whatever that was, which I thought was very unique. I would not experienced anything like that before. As the array of tank experiences are vast, many people are pleased to have an opportunity to share them. Well, I remember this one, this one woman who um, was bawling basically when she came out of the tank and she was very grateful. She told me basically that a lot of things that have been building up and that she's been suppressing you know, for a long time kind of bubbled up when, when she set foot in the tank. It really gave me that experience of, of no longer having a belief that this isn't my body, you know, that I have a body but this isn't me and it, it transformed that into a, a knowingness and, a, and an experience of it. I was seeing like little, like a, like a halo of light and um, I had to like open and close my eyes a couple of times to make sure I had turned off the lights. One of the interesting phenomena of the tank, to be in the total darkness and you're aware and awake and you open your eyes up and you're seeing sparklings of colors. The very first time I came, I had this vision of being flung into the universe, into the stars, and there was a, a wave of energy coming toward the earth. I just saw it like a heartbeat coming with new energy and uh, freshness through the entire universe, and I got to, to ride into it because I was in the float tank. And I'm not a New, 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 new person, but that was just so wonderful that I do share that. My wife's experience was actually much more profound. I dropped her off 
And when she texted me, she texted me, oh my God. Like this was, and I'm like, oh my God, what happened? Is it bad, is it good, you know? And she was like, this is the best experience I've ever had. I couldn't tell you how ecstatic she was when she came home, it was amazing. Flotation is experienced in various styles of environments, such as the flotation tank, float pod, the isolation flotation chamber, tranquility tank, float room, open float pool, and more. To this day, the most sought after experience lies in the total darkness of the original tanks, but additional features like an in-tank light have been added in some tanks to accommodate a wider array of users. So people, when, when they are floating, realize what it's like to have those muscles relaxed, which we rarely have in, in the outside world. Usually they're, at least to some extent, tense. The American Chronic Pain Association claims that chronic pain is the number one cause of adult disability in the United States. As more flexible treatment options are desired in this area, people suffering from various pain-related ailments have taken to the tank for relief. Philip was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. You know, at first he wasn't really experiencing a lot of pain or anything, but once he started on chemo and then the different complications that go with cancer, he had metastasized and spread through, you know, his liver and his lungs and started causing a lot of pain. And they just give you more and more pills and, you know, that would work to a degree, but it's not a lot of quality of life. So on a good day, anyway, we brought him over here and uh, he tried this out and it's like 60 minutes of complete relaxation, pain-free. And for someone who lives with pain every single day, every minute, that's priceless. And so, you know, desperate to find a way to help bring him some comfort, we found this and he had a bounce in his step when he walked out. And when he walked in, he was dragging. It was a nice thing to see. After about an hour in there, I feel completely different, you know, I feel like I could actually get out and do something today, you know, instead of just, you know, being around the house all day, I feel really, really relaxed, but energized at the same time. How did it feel from before you got in the float? What's the difference? Um, night and day. And it was fairly consistent that we would get the reports from people with chronic pain that they would lose awareness of their pain during the float and that experience would last 12 to 24 hours. It doesn't take away pain, but it does really help them learn how to reduce their awareness of pain. I definitely had some issues with fibromyalgia, and I find that with the floating, the, I mean, I wouldn't say it cures it by a stretch of the imagination, but at least gives me some relief that's pretty long-lasting. 14 years ago last month, I was hit by a van while I was on a bicycle and ruptured discs in my neck and my lower back and blew up the bursa in my hip and ended up with permanent nerve damage on my left side. So I was on major narcotic chronic pain medicine for 14 years. Um, I had a couple surgeries, but was still was dealing with the pain and realizing that the medicine, especially for such a long time, couldn't be good for me. It's very effective in treating both, both headache pain and muscle pain, maybe because of the Epsom salts or partly because of the Epsom salts. But the issue is, you know, if you have a problem and this works, then you don't really care whether it's the Epsom salts or the warm water or the combination or the darkness or whatever, it works. You won't talk about just a body that was hurting all over. I, I had it and I was on a lot of pain medicine. And once I've started coming here in the last three months, it's all just melting away. Had we been able to learn about this earlier, had it been something of knowledge that was out there, you know, it would have been great. But now that we know, and with Philip having experienced it firsthand, you know, I wish he was here with his voice to be able to tell you. I mean, he wrote on the wall back there, and, you know, basically he said, I've never, ever felt this relaxed. You know, thank you. I have more energy. I'm clear-headed. I'm getting healthier, I'm eating better, I'm sleeping better, I don't have the chronic insomnia that I was having. It's just, it's been amazing. 
My pain management doctor was really great about it. When I told him, I said, hey, I'm, I'm off of all of it. I don't want the medicine anymore. And here's what I'm doing. He says, man, he says, that is so incredible. He says, I should have you talk to some of my other chronic pain patients. He was really glad to hear that I was able to make that sort of healthy change. I am at the point to where I can say, oh my God, it feels good to be alive. Tank availability is primarily offered through facilities commonly known as float centers and are sometimes referred to as float spas and tank centers. Float centers can be found all over the world and are most prevalent in Europe and the United States. Tanks are often incorporated into wellness centers and are sometimes coupled with non-medicinal healing and relaxation modalities like massage, acupuncture, hydrotherapy, and yoga. Float center owners come from all different walks of life. Often, a passion to share the experience with others, rooted in witnessing its usefulness, is the driving force behind the opening of many tank centers. People over time who have floated with us consistently have made um, some major changes in their lives. Changing jobs or deciding you know, about one big thing or another and they attribute it absolutely to floating. And we've even talked with them more about that. Like, really? You know, are, are you sure it was the float tank? Are you sure? And they say, yes, absolutely it was. And I'm so glad. We have a two tank center. Just, I want people to be able to bring a friend to kind of help with that, that weirdness factor. And without fail, it's never the person that came in getting the big benefit. It's the person they drug in here so that they didn't have to feel as weird. The person that just sat there not wanting to talk, they're shaking, they don't want to look at you. And they come out of the tank just looking like they're completely blissed out. It's just, it's amazing. And they want to sit here and tell me about how great it is. <laughs> like, like, I didn't know, you know, it, it, that's incredible. Somebody that didn't even want to be here and now they're trying to sell it to somebody that owns a float center. That's amazing. Having these people come out of their float tanks and seeing their reactions and seeing how much it's just really helping people is so gratifying. Like, it just really is. How are you doing? Doing good. I'm great. I just floated, of course. <laughs> that feeling of well-being, that sense of relief, that sense of satisfaction to experience themselves differently, completely unaided by anything except themselves. There is just an incredible way that people look when they come out of float tanks. Everybody will talk about the post-float glow, and it's, it's consistent. It's incredible. Their skin does actually glow. It's kind of hard to describe it, but it, they do have like a glowing look to them. Sometimes I feel like, oh my God, just, yeah, just laugh, laugh, laugh. So excited, just without any reason, just feel good. Like I'm high, but I'm not high, but feel high, you know? <laughs> yeah. In the 1950s, contemplations in the field of neurophysiology regarding the sources of the brain's energy were being postulated. Some hypothesized that the brain was simply a reactive organ that would be void of activity in the absence of external input, slipping into a coma-like state. Would the brain remain functioning if stimulation from the outside world was eliminated? What was eventually discovered over a series of studies was that not only did one remain conscious in the absence of stimulus input, but at a very unique capacity. Roughly speaking, if you look at the two hemispheres of the brain, visualization, nonverbal processes, emotions, and so on are under the control of the right hemisphere. That's way oversimplified, but it's kind of generally accurate. And so we think what happens is that you no longer have to monitor the, the stimulation in the external world because there isn't any. You have no problems to solve logically. You have no verbal information to process. Nobody's talking to you and you're not talking to anybody. 
And so we think that what happens is that the right hemisphere becomes less dominated by the left hemisphere than is the case in the normal environment. Normal environment, the left hemisphere rules. In the tank, that changes. Now the left hemisphere may still be dominant, but it's not as dominant. What happens is that imagery becomes more vivid, that nonverbal memories become more vivid, the parts of the brain that govern the non-logical, non-rational, non-systematic information processing come into their own more. And that's why you get the effects you get. It's a hypothesis. It has been suggested that since ancient times, sensory reduction has been used across cultures to intentionally induce different states of consciousness. Spiritual leaders, philosophers, tribal initiates, and even followers of Pythagoras are said to have retreated to the seclusion and darkness of tunnels, caves, and catacombs in order to gain forms of insight and wisdom through mystical revelations. Let's fast forward to the late 1950s, when Dr. John Lilly and his associate Dr. Jay Shirley were conducting experiments in isolation at the National Institute of Mental Health. To study the connection between the brain and mind, as well as the origins of conscious experience, Lilly deduced that they first needed to separate the brain from outside influence. To do this, they developed a system to restrict external stimulation as much as possible, which involved subjects floating upright in a large tank while wearing a breathing apparatus. Over the years, the tank's general design was simplified, which eventually involved floating in a lying down position with salt saturating the water. Heaters, air pumps, and water filters were eventually added. To much surprise, unexpected due to the melodramatic aura of past sensory reduction experiments, Lilly and Shirley noted extremely pleasant and relaxing effects, coupled with unique patterns in thinking. In 1972, a computer programmer named Glenn Perry had attended a tank workshop held by John Lilly. At this workshop, he had such a powerful tank experience that he decided to construct his own. With the help of Dr. Lilly, Glenn worked to refine his tank design, constructing a tank that was quite inexpensive and easy to maintain. Glenn and his now wife Lee started the first flotation tank company, Samadhi, which started selling tanks in 1973. Samadhi opened the first commercial float tank center in Beverly Hills, and similar centers began surfacing all over the country. Floating became quite popular, experiencing wide uses, from sports teams to celebrities. Then, interest dropped off. It has been noted that the AIDS scare of the 1980s caused public water facilities like pools, spas, and float centers to suffer. Flotation experienced as a lull until the mid-2000s, when a resurgence in interest started taking hold. So you haven't floated before, this is your first time. Uh, what are your thoughts on it right now? What do you think of it? Um, actually, I have no idea until I get into this facility and then I'm kind of thinking like it's uh, your body float in the water. I heard it's about 60 minutes and I'm thinking I'll just give it a shot. A real hallucination you believe is real. You know, if you're schizophrenic and, and you're hallucinating little spaceships coming down from the sky, um, you believe that. You believe that that's a real thing. You can, you can scan it from side to side. You can't make it go away by saying, no, I don't believe this, and so on. 
If you apply those criteria to visual sensations in the tank, no, they're not, they're not hallucinations. And they could be daydreams, they could get very vivid uh, auditory and visual imagery, very vivid memories sometimes, and, and you get these things like retinal flashes and so on, and sometimes you can elaborate those like, that looks like a fireworks display, but you know it's not really a fireworks display. First, I was very skeptical. Um, it sounded like something that um, someone drew up in a mad lab or something like that. In the earlier days of floating, there were a lot of people who were more on the fringe of things. Some people would even say oddballs. And so a lot of statements were being made about that you could space out and go off into oblivion and come back and you, you could be changed forever. And it took on kind of an aura of, uh, you know, California, razzle-dazzle, hippie, guru, mystical stuff. And that movie Altered States came out, which basically put the subject of floating into this more macabre view that you can genetically alter and become a monkey. So I was looking at that from the standpoint of, boy, do we have, we have a huge mountain to climb to develop credibility for this in any level because all this groundwork was laid before we ever got into it. The flotation experience is commonly labeled sensory deprivation, which has acquired confusion with long-term sensory reduction and monotonous stimulation used in early experimental methods, which yielded many unpleasant effects. Pre-experiment anxiety provoked by panic buttons and psychological legal release forms is said to have created many of the reported negative outcomes, which were noted to have ceased when these protocols were eliminated. The term sensory deprivation is totally inaccurate. Sensory deprivation implies that you remove all sensations. Well, the only way you can remove all sensations is to sever the afferent nerves. And you wouldn't get too many volunteers for that, and ethics committees wouldn't like it either. So it's not deprivation, it's reduction. I think even the term deprivation has associated with it that it's being taken away from you and we're in control of you. There was so much mythology about the dangers of sensory deprivation. People are using it for, to talk about brainwashing and torture and the mistreatment of prisoners in various political prisons and so on. If you had taken a psychology course back in the 1970s, late 1960s, you would have learned sensory deprivation could make you hallucinate or become psychotic. They compared it to LSD trips where, where people had ideation that was totally out of control and, and sometimes very bizarre, What's what one researcher called a model psychosis. I, I really think that the mindset that they entered there with was that the goal of this is to try and mess me up. Whereas when you're doing floating in the flotation tank, the goal is to help prepare people for a relaxing experience. And that was exactly the opposite of the goal of the original sensory deprivation studies, which were designed to stress people. So I think we did an excellent job of surmounting a lot of that with data over a period of about 15 years. So I looked for a term that would be more positive or at least neutral rather than negative and we came up with the term restricted environmental stimulation and then we added either technique or therapy at the end depending on what you were do using it for. So it's REST, REST which is a very nice acronym, very positive, relaxing and so on and uh, that has caught on. I love running uh, the float works. You know, just seeing the look on people's faces, just sometimes people come into the center, they'll have an hour's float, they'll come out again, and you just can't even recognize it's the same person. You know, people's faces just really just relax.
To successfully trigger physiological relaxation, reduced sensory stimulation and decreased body movement while remaining awake are necessary. As the tank maximizes these variables, it is often described as being the most relaxing environment in the world. We get used to very high levels of stimulation, probably much higher than the, the human species was evolved to deal with because in earlier days we didn't have that much. And I think probably too high uh, in the sense of, of evolutionary background. Lots of moving things all the time, lots of people around, so that I think one of the reasons why floating is so relaxing and positive in its effects is that it gives you time out from that high level of stimulation. Whenever you can free the mind and the body from all of that sensory input, it's like having a vacation and you can really relax. As a flight attendant, it makes me a lot more patient. Your day could be just the worst you've ever had and you just want to scream and you can come in here for an hour and you come out and it's like, it's no big deal. We call it being, being an anti-stress ninja. We're just, once you start floating enough, man, nothing bothers you. The tank itself provides so much physical support that it's sort of the ideal environment to have a completely relaxed experience. My job involves a lot of emotional demand. And when I'm in the float tank, it's really just sort of letting go of all of that and just focusing on me, not worrying about clients, not worrying about students. Um, and so that's a release from the demands of my profession for 60 minutes, which is really nice. The level of relaxation elicited in the flotation experience has been shown to have physiological effects that have broad implications on general health and well-being. We felt that looking at physiological measurements of people who were using the tank on a repeated basis could be a way to establish whether in fact your physiology was being affected. So we started looking at blood pressure and heart rate and finding in those experiments that they would be experiencing not only a, a within session decrease, but they would be getting an average lower decrease across time and when repeated sessions. There are a fair number of studies on this, well controlled, and it reduces blood pressure in people who have normal blood pressure, and it reduces blood pressure in people who have hypertension. That's the bottom line. The American Medical Association credits stress as the basic cause of more than 60% of all human illness and disease. It is often considered the number one proxy killer. Tests have indicated that floating increased the secretion of endorphins and reduced the levels of a number of stress-related neurochemicals, such as adrenaline and cortisol, substances that can cause tension, anxiety, and irritability. One of the things that happens when there's chronic stress is that feedback loops get disrupted. And if this goes on for a long enough time, it begins to evidence itself in a clinical problem. You know, like uh, hypertension or GI tract disorders, dermatitis. And so that leads you into the concept that, geez, chronic stress could lead to things like alterations in immune system function and alterations in cell function associated with the immune system that could lead to disorders like allergies, cancer, etc. So to us this was like wow we found that mathematically the variability in the levels of cortisol was reduced over time with repeated floating. The suggestion being you were actually seeing that the floating experiences on a repeated basis were leading to improved physiological regulation in this feedback control system for cortisol. Even after they stopped floating for a couple weeks after that, they still had lower cortisol levels than they did when they had started before they had started floating. So we thought, gee, this looks like some sort of a carryover effect.
what we found at the Medical College of Ohio is that it kind of puts you back into, a, into the reset mode. So if you're out of whack structurally, biochemically, in terms of your sleep-wake cycles, it kind of brings you back into a baseline within certain parameters. I'm uh, looking for different modalities for the treatment of Parkinson's and one of the symptoms is uh, lack of e equilibrium and I think in the floating the equilibrium has an op opportunity to Im improve. Maybe when not confronted with all these inputs the mind and body will find a way to regulate to the most beneficial level of functioning in kind of a passive way. Uh, I can tell my anxiety levels and my stress levels are up, which also tend to exacerbate my, Parkinson, my Parkinsonian symptoms, which are the shakes and stiffness, and my voice gets a little quivery sometimes when my symptoms are real bad. And floating definitely works for me and helps with my Parkinson symptoms, so... Uh, for that, I'm very grateful because I'm one of these guys, I'm willing to try anything and everything at this point. I'm still got half my life, I think, to live, and I want to live it as best as, uh, as best I can. So if floating is going to help me do that, then I'm a believer. I'm a lifer. While interest in flotation has been experiencing a resurgence in recent years, accessibility to tanks is still fairly scarce throughout America and other parts of the world, especially in places far from major metro areas. As of 2014, there's over 130 places to float in North America. Some people offer flotation in their homes to provide the experience to areas without commercial float tank centers. Nice to meet you. Come on in. Thanks. So all you need to do when you're ready to go in is push down, slide open. Shanti and Jay have been offering the experience through a tank in their Ben Lomond, California home since 2011. You lay down, you go bloop. <laughs> Alma Sander Landis is a massage therapist in the small town of Mossville, Illinois, who floats people through a samadhi tank in the basement of her home. This area in the Midwest has no place to float, and I thought I would be a pioneer leading the field, leading the way, introducing floating to this whole central Illinois area. And people just have never heard about floating. They don't know what it is, they're scared of it, and hopefully we can uh, rectify that situation. Some people are also apprehensive about coming to somebody's home for a float that they don't know too. So there's the, there's the flip side of that too. But the upside is, you know, once they get to know that it's a safe environment, it's, it's much more relaxed for them. Samadhi is a Sanskrit word, which has been used to describe the single pointedness of mind where one sustains a state of concentration and awareness. Being in a space that allows an escape from outward attention, many people describe their focus narrowing in on how they feel physically, on how they're thinking, or simply immersed in their current experience, often described as being present or in the state of being. Way back, I was married once before, and uh, I was going through counseling going, what did I do wrong? I mean, I got to do this. I did this. I was committed. I was doing everything right. I was doing it. And she said, man, you're, you're quite the human doing. <laughs> and I went, you know, I immediately know where she was headed with that. She says, why not, why not the human being side of it? Why not just be instead of do all the time? Be? Well, well how do I do being? <laughs> you know, still in that doing mode. I'm one of those people that has that kind of crazy tape loop thought where you, you know, you're, oh man, I, I would have said this, and you know, if he would have said that, I would have said this, and I get kind of stuck in that. So by going in the tank, it just stops that whole chatter. I have found that when I'm in a situation, if I'd floated a couple of days before, my focus becomes a lot more clear. Uh, and it is not so tunnel vision. It allows you to enter thought processes 
where you're free of the physical restraints of the body. Even without any training, you're almost immediately at a space where it, it may take many meditators months, if not years, to get to. It's like meditation on, on rocket fuel. One of the most popular forms of meditation that's used even in a medical treatment is something called mindfulness meditation. It's sort of a clearing of the mind and attending to just what's happening. When I float, I try to remove my thoughts and I begin to get a very deep sense physically and soulfully of who I am. And the longer I've floated over these years, the deeper I can go into that. If you're, you're so busy, your mind is constantly, constantly going over some similar things, similar routines, almost like a computer. Um, and it's really good to just have a break from that. You're just getting like that kind of 50,000 foot view over your life. This is the perfect tool for self-observation with no noise, no interruption, just you. All that clutter that happens in everyday life, it's a great time just to step away and defragment your mind. Initially, you can sort of sense the water. You can be aware of your own body tension. So the tank acts in many ways as a container that sort of forces you into a mindfulness situation. A number of professional sports teams and competitors have been known to capitalize on the tank for the purposes of sports visualization. A number of small studies involving tennis serves, basketball free throws, dart throwing, rifle marksmanship, and pilot simulator training coupled with flotation all yielded positive outcomes. I go through the motions of running, I go through the race, and I visualize myself uh, running a certain way, I visualize my form, and visualizing it without any other distractions has been extremely beneficial. When I played for the Oakland A's, we actually had an hour uh, before every practice where we would just sit down and be quiet and close our eyes and they would tell us to visualize us succeeding. So as soon as I floated, you know, it just felt right. As demand for easy access to flotation has grown, at-home, do-it-yourself tank building has become increasingly popular as an affordable way to get floating. I was at a point where I was dying to float and I uh, wanted to build a tank Actually, I wanted to buy a tank, but there was nothing under 5,000 bucks. Definitely nothing I could get into my basement. So I ended up building plant. I built the whole tank from scratch, and I documented the whole thing, kept my receipts, and now I sell the plans online, and it's, it's working great. It's helping a lot of people float, and it's, it's just been a real great thing for the floating community. It's a low barrier of entry. You can get floating for about 2,500 bucks, so it's been great. All right. This is where it all started, an unfinished basement. You can actually see the places I moved the tank down, <laughs> down in. This is, this is her. Took me maybe a couple months to build. It's actually huge. You wouldn't get, if I was laying in it, you would see the size more. But I mean, we're talking nine by probably over five feet. So the inside, I was trying to find a tank that would fit a body, of course. And I ended up using a fertilizer tank. I filled all the framing with house insulation, even the roof's insulated, so that, because I figured if everything's off, I want to be able to hold the temperature very easily. I use garage threshold. Come out of the end of the tank and go into the pump. Uh, this is actually the original pump I started with. It runs full time, except when I'm floating, then I turn everything off. Out of the mechanical side comes over here, and right before I put the water back in that's warm, I actually run it through an ozonator, and I put a venturi on it so I can decide how much ozone goes through the water. It's been, it's been great, it's worked out awesome.
with floating, I think it connects people, it connects people to themselves, to other people, to what there is to do. There's so many great things to do in the world, to work, to create. You get ideas, you're clear. We did a study on jazz musicians, university students in, in jazz performance. We had them float and then play improvisational jazz. And then we had those the records of that rated by professors of music who were, who were jazz specialists. And we found that there was an increase in an aspect of creativity uh, as rated by those professors who didn't know that, that this was what the experiment was. Music that was produced after floating was superior in creativity, according to the judgment of these professors, uh, than the music that they were producing without the rest. So it, as far as the data go, rest does increase creativity, but there's not enough research to you know, really swear by that. Although much progress has been made with flotation research, lack of a concise scientific theory to explain rest's vast array of positive effects, coupled with subsequent lack of funding, led to a waning of flotation research in the 90s. Due to confusing association with forced extended sensory deprivation, textbook authors ignored rest, leading to new generations of professionals and students failing to learn about it. They all led us back to the same basic issue. You don't have enough subjects with the limited funds that are available. And that's what was a limiting factor for us throughout. This has left rest in a position of suggesting many benefits, but for many small studies, unable to be extrapolated with high confidence. Now, uh, what, what, what our responsibility is, as far as being uh, in the industry such as we are, is providing a facility then uh, that people are able to come into and expect a uh, high level of quality and cleanliness. Due to the nature of sharing water in an enclosed space, two of the most common concerns of float newcomers and enthusiasts alike are air quality and sanitation of the tank's water. While each manufacturer differs, a combination of a cartridge filter that extracts physical particulates and various sanitation systems are currently used between each user. Public health codes for commercial use are still needed in most states, where float tanks are not categorized as a pool or spa. However, various independent safety organizations are working towards safety and product standards. And the salt is kind of the last part of the equation, and so we get the natural benefit of having a really just kind of organic sanitizer in there to begin with. We found that floating is a very personal experience that impacts everyone in a unique way. Often, people require multiple floats to see what the experience holds for them. I started for new floaters to just say, you just bought yourself a piece of nothing. <laughs> and then they look at the shock on their faces and they said, yeah, this is what you're going to experience first, nothing. Floating came from a place where there were some very large statements that were made about how great and wonderful it, it is. And that leads to expectations. People want you to tell them what they're going to experience. And I know that it's impossible and it's actually almost harmful for me to tell them what they're going to experience because all that does is gives them attachments um, to things that will prevent them from actually letting the float experience happen. And whatever experience they have, is the ideal experience for them at that time. There's so much benefit to it. It's really, it's hard to appreciate if you haven't experienced the tank yourself. 
anything that they think is going to happen in there, they're going to be in there waiting for that to happen until they get out. When they get out, they'll feel great. And that's when it'll actually make sense that, that nothing is what is supposed to happen. You shouldn't think anything at all. Here's what it is. You're going to go in there and you're going to be in there with you, period. And you could feel comfortable about coming here and getting with yourself and then come back and next time you go somewhere else. If 10% of the global population were floating. So 700 million floaters. Wow, what a cool place this would be. <laughs> It would be a, a, probably a very different world. I mean, like, completely different world. <laughs> Life on this planet would become so much more pleasant. We treat each other so much better. I hope that that happens. That's kind of my goal and ambition for floating, is that it gets to the point where, you know, a significant portion of the population is doing it. It's very hard to go on in a violent manner. It's very hard to be so judgmental when you're left kind of in the quiet darkness to think about your actions. There'd be a connection when we looked at one another that we both kind of understood and didn't really need to talk about. I think we'd be able to shift towards a more collaborative or cooperative, more unified way of being. Once you're in that state, and then you meet somebody else in that state, you know, it's like a recognition of our unity. I think that uh, you would see a lot of people that were more happy, more nice to each other. For me personally, when I got into a rhythm and started floating, I was surprised at how nice I was. That's 10% of the world now that feels better in themselves. They feel better about themselves. They feel better being them. And when people feel calm and okay with who they are, they're much more likely to be accepting of who other people are. So you just floated, sort of describe your experience going into the tank and, and how your first time was. How'd it go? Oh, amazing. I feel refreshed. Um, actually, I fell asleep. I fell asleep there. Do you think you might come back and try it again? I would definitely try it again because um, at first I really don't know what to expect, but I think I'm going to give it a try and to be more relaxed, I guess. I'm having a hard time to just let go and not think of anything, but now I know how it is. Uh, I'll definitely give it another try. Having traveled across the country, we've seen the many benefits that flotation can offer firsthand. Whether it's a sensory reduction, the salt water, staying still, or just getting away from it all, floating is undeniably making its mark in the lives of many. With tank centers servicing across the globe and new research efforts taking hold, our hope is that more people begin to see the very real advantages that flotation has to offer. With so much to gain and so much distraction to lose, what will your float experience be?
having them incorporated into health centers and gyms and and I want one in my house. I would like to see it mainstream so that people have an option with their health insurance, you know, like they do in Sweden. My hope in five to ten years is that there are as many float centers as there are gyms. We can get tanks in people's houses. I could only see floating just evolving. In the future, I think continuing to do quantification and research with it is going to, to help move it forward. I see it more as an essential tool, like a community center, but you'd have floating and you'd have good food and you'd have gardening and you'd have film and music and art. My other hope is that universities are having it and colleges as a tool for students to accelerate their learning capacity. It's so amazingly beneficial. I really feel like every school should have a bunch of them. I feel like they should be in every high school. They should be in colleges. They should be, they, it, I think it helps people. We're definitely still moving along in the right path by fostering and furthering flotation because I think it has potential that definitely hasn't been explored. It would be nice to include it in the regular approaches that we use with people with chronic pain. I think the Veterans Administration in their pain programs with people uh, who've been injured or struggling with chronic pain from military and combat exposure. It's going to just continue to grow and it will finally reach a threshold level where it will become a valuable therapeutic agent as well as a relaxation tool. Now that there seems to be a resurgence of interest, both for commercial floating and in the research, uh, the important thing is to do that systematic kind of study that had been recommended by the reviewers 20 years ago. So it could put the whole enterprise on a, on a much better scientific basis, which in turn feeds into the commercial enterprise because then they can say, this is what we know uh, will work and if you have this kind of problem, you should come in and float because we know that the effects are, are reliable. So everybody benefits. The clients benefit, the scientists benefit, and the commercial float uh, managers benefit. Couldn't be better. What I would like to see is a truly uh, solid and strong-based investigative effort to examine this subject of flotation and alterations in brain function and alterations in physiology to explore these things that we've laid some foundation for it by finding effects with small numbers of people that were statistically significant. And therefore, our belief <laughs> would be that if you get a larger number of people together, there may be hidden things that you didn't know about that would emerge that you could see. But I do see it in, in all the military um, facilities for PTSD. From my perspective, I think what needs to happen is the research needs to be done um, in order to show that this is indeed an effective treatment for a variety of different conditions um, that deal with anxiety as its ultimate root. What we're doing, we're cutting down senses. So I think in the future, we're gonna cut down the majority of the senses and enhance one. You know, like let's say someone's musically inclined and they just wrote a score and they want to see how that sounds inside the tank with no distractions. I'd like to see a continuation of what I think is already happening within the flotation industry, which is more communication, more collaboration, um, more sharing of information, more research, corroborating the benefits of floating. I would like to see a, f a future floating where it, it doesn't um, really disappear from the mass consciousness like it really has over the last 20 years. Where it actually really takes hold this time and is adopted um, across the board throughout societies all over the world. Google, Apple, creative companies can use it for enhancing all of their employees' ideas. I mean, <laughs> there's infinite potential with these tanks. This almost gotta be at least a once a week thing, probably <laughs> I have to, you know? It's good, man. I feel my body tingling right now. Just <laughs> it's amazing. I think so.